Lord Jesus, in this holy moment, we welcome the presence of your Holy Spirit and we sing to the illumining of others. Now we ask that you would speak to our hearts and to our spirits through the hearing of your word, that our faith might grow and we might be able to serve you even better. Through your great name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Today we conclude our series on what to do when the fastened seatbelt light comes on. Um, it is a series we began actually five weeks ago. It had four topics and we had all laid it out and of course each week we've unpackaged something different. And we, you'll remember the setting of this is when you hit turbulence. And we use that as a metaphor because every one of us at times, um, some more frequently than others, are going to hit turbulent conditions in our flight of life. And it is a time that the fastened seatbelt comes on. Now, that light will come on usually three times in the flight process. First of all is when what? Take you take off. Second of all, when you yeah. land. And then when you're experiencing turbulence. Anyone experience turbulence? Oh, come on. Okay. Experience turbulence. And what happens is our natural person is afraid. We experience all of the natural emotions such as the fear and the pain and the anxiety and the, and the worry and all the other things that go along with that. Um, panic is another thing and I'm kind of looking along with you there. We overact. And uh, sometimes we are just plain afraid. But God's got alternatives for each one of those emotions that He really wants us to experience. And those are to, that we would know peace in the midst of the turbulence. And be calm in the midst of the turbulence. And maintain control in the midst of the turbulence. And what? Say that. Have faith. You know, now notice, He doesn't stop the turbulence, but He provides the gifts that enable us to endure turbulence. To tell you, you're going to have smooth sailing every flight you take would be just a lie. But to tell you, as Jesus did, you're going to have tribulation and turbulence in this life, but then to say, it's okay. Be of good cheer. Because I've overcome the world and I have the solutions for the turbulence that you'll encounter. And so, we've talked about the things that we need to do when we experience that turbulence. The first thing we do is what? Pray. Second thing we do is Amen. remember. The third thing we do is we seek. We seek God. And today we come to that fourth and final in this series. We follow. We follow. You know, as I was uh, today, we conclude our series. on what to do when the fastened seatbelt light comes on. Um, it is a series we began actually five weeks ago. It had four topics, and we had all laid it out. And of course, each week we've unpackaged something different. And we, you'll remember the setting of this is when you hit turbulence. And we use that as a metaphor because every one of us at times, um, some more frequently than others, are going to hit turbulent conditions in our flight of life. And it is a time that the fastened seatbelt comes on. Now, that light will come on usually three times in the flight process. First of all is when what? Take off. You take off. Second of all, when you yeah. land. And then when you're experiencing turbulence. Anyone experience turbulence? No. Oh, come on. Okay. Experience turbulence. And what happens is our natural person is afraid. We experience all of the natural emotions such as the fear and the pain and the anxiety and the, and the worry and all the other things that go along with that. Um, panic is another thing and I'm kind of looking along with you there. We overact. And uh, sometimes we're just plain afraid. But God's got alternatives for each one of those emotions that He really wants us to experience. And those are to, that we would know peace 
in the midst of the turbulence and be calm in the midst of the turbulence and maintain control in the midst of the turbulence and what? Say that. Have faith. You know, now notice, he doesn't stop the turbulence, but he provides the gifts that enable us to endure turbulence. To tell you, you're going to have smooth sailing every flight you take would be just a lie. But to tell you, as Jesus did, you're going to have tribulation and turbulence in this life, but then to say, it's okay. Be of good cheer. Because I've overcome the world and I have the solutions for the turbulence that you'll encounter. And so, we've talked about the things that we need to do when we experience that turbulence. The first thing we do is what? Pray. Pray. Second thing we do is Amen. remember. The third thing we do is we seek. We seek God. And today we come to that fourth and final in this series, we follow. We follow. You know, as I was uh, preparing this, and actually this past week has been an unusual week. We've... Uh, We've had memorial celebrations, the earth calls and funerals, but we've had memorial celebrations for three saints that have gone to be with Jesus in this past week. And Shirley Short is here this morning, and I think it's a real tribute to the faith that that family has shared as, as uh, we celebrated Howard's life and a life well lived with a full church and an exciting time together this past week. And it's an honor that you would be here today, Shirley, and we continue to pray for you. Um, but we, we experience those times. We press through. We can have all of the excuses in the world. How bad I feel. How much I'm hurt. How angry I am. And, and, and just want all of these natural emotions. And God says, wait a second. I'm in control. Wait a second. Have you forgotten? You know the bumper sticker they used to say, God is my co-pilot? That scares me. I want him to be the pilot. You know? I don't even want to be in the cabin when he's flying, to be frank with you. I'd rather him just take control. And so it scares me when I see people say, well, I want to be my co-pilot. The problem with that is you want control and you want God to have control. It's time to take your hands off your control and let God be the pilot. And so today we're going to talk about what it means to follow. But just one word about this fast and seatbelt. Um, at a, uh, a funeral director told me yesterday, he said, I don't know if you can use this joke. He said it was about Billy Graham. So Billy Graham, about 10 or 15 years ago, was flying somewhere across country, and it was a long flight, and he had been put in um, the cabin there. There was a space between him and this other guy, but the other guy just had very little manners and very little tooth, and, and as the flight was progressing, he was having a drink, and then another drink, and another drink, and his language was becoming more foul and more corrupt. And finally, one of the stewardesses came over and said, Sir, would you please... Please be careful and hold your tongue. You're sitting next to Billy Graham. And the guy looked at him and he said, Are you really Bill, Billy Graham? Billy turned and said, Yes, I am. He said, I want to shake your hands. Your sermons have meant so much to me. <laughs> you know? Sometimes that happens, doesn't it? Today we're going to talk about what it means to follow. You know, football is a game of four quarters. Running a marathon is like that as well. It's not enough to start well. You're going to get tired in the process. Sometimes in a marathon, you're going to bump into somebody, you're going to fall over. Certainly in football, there's a team out there that's fighting against you. And so you have to press on. You don't just walk down the field with the ball in your hand. You're going to constantly be buffeted in your personal life, in your family life, sometimes in your finances, your spiritual life, because that's the way the world is. There's an enemy out there that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. God wants us to move forward. And in many ways, the Christian life is like this. It's not enough to start with a bang. All of us have experienced that. When we come to Christ, we're fresh, we're new, we're, um, we're excited about our faith. And then as days go on and events happen and we meet other people, and it just sometimes will drag you down and, and you lose that glow. And I think God's constantly desiring that we would have fresh wind, fresh spirit, fresh fire, fresh experiences with Him. You know, the scripture says, morning by morning, new mercies, I see. How do we respond to those new mercies? That's what God's in the business of doing, providing mercy by mercy by mercy. But are we seeing those things? Is that where our eyes are focused? 
I heard it said this past week, we have too many amateur Christians who are a mile wide and an inch deep. A mile wide and an inch deep. Following Jesus Christ is not a hobby. The collecting stamps or bottle caps or anything like that, it demands a total commitment of our lives. In our text this morning, Paul's going to share with us four principles for winning the prize when the game of life is over. And again, we need to be reminded, you were created for eternity. This brief life is like a vapor that vanishes. The older you get, the more real that becomes. But it's something that young people should heed as well, and should know that the length of years is not guaranteed to any. It is a life day by day, lived to the fullest that God wants us to experience. And so... We learn lessons from the end of Paul's life that apply to you no matter, and me, no matter where we are in life. Principle number one is you want to check your direction. Check your direction. Paul writes these verses from Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to be preaching from the text here from verses 12 to 21. He begins with 12, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already been made perfect, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now see, he's, he's reaching for something that's the goal, but he says that goal is also reaching to take me. And then he says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on. Say that word, press on, those two words. Press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. So he gives us this long shot picture that we're called heavenward. But what's the short term goal? To press on and to do what? Go forward. You know, if this text does anything else or nothing else, it should put to an end any of the deceitful thinking that we sometimes may erroneously conceive. We ain't perfect and we ain't there yet. I know that isn't good English, but at least you'll remember. We're not perfect. We're not there yet. Here is the man who wrote half the New Testament, and what's the first thing he says to these Philippians? He doesn't judge them. He doesn't condemn them. He doesn't talk about them. He just says, you know what? I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. That's so unlike so many, so many people today that have difficulty admitting their own shortcomings. Beloved, we fail to do that. We fail to admit our vulnerabilities and be transparent. And, and if we err on that side of looking down upon others, that's just not pleasing to the heart of God. And so this is what Paul says. He's, first he says, I'm not there yet. And, and this is going to be important for us in just a few moments. And then twice he says, I press on. Say, I press on. I press on. That means I'm not where I want to be, but I'm going to keep moving in that direction. I'm going to keep moving in that direction. I'm going to keep pressing on. I'm going to keep going forward because I'm not there yet. Where is there? It's there. How do you get there? Move forward. That's where there is. I hope that makes sense. And note the, the fierce concentration that is implicit in his words. He says, one thing I do. This one thing I do. I've got my eyes on the cross. I'm going to press forward. And I'm going to do it continually. And I'm going to let that be my focus. This one thing I do. You see, to understand this, if you want to excel in any area of your life, you've got to focus. You've got to say, this one thing I do. Not these 20 things I do. But a single-minded focus in any endeavor. For instance, a great artist must say, this one thing I do, and focus on that art. Uh, a, a gifted teacher has to say, one thing I do. A championship athlete has to say, one thing I do. A single parent raising her child must say, one thing I do. That's got to be your priority. That's got to be your focus. Other things come in line. Other things play their part. It's got to be a focus. This one thing I do. A student who wants to graduate with honors. It doesn't just happen. Do we have any students who graduated with honors? I can't raise them. Nobody? Okay, how about half honors? Huh? Okay, all right. 
I don't know what that means, but just, I wanted somebody to raise their hand. <laughs> Scared. Greatness in any arena comes to those who can say with the Apostle Paul, one thing I do. And in this case, it meant looking toward the heavenly goal of winning the prize. And what is the prize? The high calling of Christ upon our lives. God has for us, when we finally stand before Jesus and hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And as I've said before, but I want to remind you, Sometimes we throw that out as a blanket statement. Like everybody who arrives in heaven, they're going to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's not what he said. This is only when you've fought the fight and, and finished the race and kept the faith. Some of you, he's going to say, well, it's about the time you got here. And some of you are going to say, it's only about the grace of God I'm opening the door. But some of you are going to say, well done, you good and faithful servant. You were good stewards of the gifts and talents I gave you. You kept your focus and you, and you set your mind and your heart in agreement with my will and spirit and you let me lead you. You submitted your will to my will. That's what servanthood is about. He's the master. We're the servants. We don't tell him what to do. He tells us. And then we do that. 100 years ago, a young man from a wealthy family named William Borden entered Yale University. His family intended for him to go into the family business, Borden business. But along that career at Yale, some people shared Jesus with him. They found a higher calling than being successful in business. And, and God just got a grip on his heart. And so to the dismay of his family and his friends, he felt called to go to the country of China. And he left America, but he never made it to China. He succumbed to a disease before reaching that distant shore on the travel to become a missionary. Doesn't that make you wonder what's God up to? Here's a man who gave all his heart and life and was ready to go serve Jesus. And life was cut short on the way to the mission field. Well, we don't have all the answers. But it's a matter of faith that we pursue the calling of God. And so... After his friends came and got his body, a note was found in his effects that summarized his life, and that note read with these words, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. At the end of today, can we be able to put our head on the pillow and say, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. I'm following Jesus after that heart and the high calling. I've submitted my will to his. I've put aside my preferences for his greater goals. Another example, you've heard of Dr. David Livingstone. He was a pioneer medical missionary in Africa. And when he returned to Great Britain, he was asked, where do you now want to go? Listen to his answer. I am ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. I'm ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. No looking back, looking forward, that's where I'm called. So, do we want to win the race that's set before us? Well, first of all, we have to check our direction and make sure that we're moving in God's direction. You see, everyone goes somewhere in life. Where will you be when you get where you're going? Where will you be when you get where you're going? Principle number two, follow faithful leaders. Listen to these words in chapter, in, in verses 15 through 17. All of us who are mature this is Paul speaking to the church at Philippi. And he speaks collectively. And he says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, well, God will make clear to you. He'll make clear to you the truth. We don't always agree. But God's going to make it clear as we talk, as we dialogue, and as we and submit ourselves to him. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Beloved, it amazes me how short-term memory we have as the people of God when it comes to the blessings of God. We can, we can forget His blessings so easily the first time we hit turbulence. We forget how God, remember that was the second point of the whole step. The, when you hit turbulence, what do you do? You remember, this is where God took us from. If you look around this congregation, yes, we've lost so many members, but God's sending us new ones, and it's such a joy because we're moving forward in that direction. 
And, and collectively, we are called to be the people of God. And so Paul says, God's going to make that clear. And then he says, only let us live up to what we've already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers. And take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Now notice how Paul puts it in verse 17. What does Paul say? Follow my example. That seems like an astounding thing to say. If you want to learn how to pray, follow me. If you want to learn how to become an evangelist, follow me. If you want to learn how to study the Bible, follow me. Doesn't that ring a little inconsistent and maybe a little prideful that Paul would say, well, wait, follow Christ. Now, Paul said, follow me. And that's sometimes hard for us to grasp because guess what? We are sheep and it is not in our nature to follow, is it? Jesus put it very quick, very uh, adept when he said, uh, according to the prophet Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. You see, sheep want to go this way and they want to go that way and they don't want to follow a shepherd. But what does Paul say? Follow me, follow my example. He wrote to Timothy, follow me as I follow Christ. Now understand, this is in the context of what did he say first? I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. But follow me anyway. Help keep me in line. Help follow me. But do this. This is the pattern that God's given us. Six different times in the New Testament, Paul says, follow me. Now do you think he meant it or not? Was he an egotistical bragger? Did he think he was a perfect Christian? Not at all. In verse 12, he clearly says that he's not arrived at spiritual completion. Follow me? What he meant was, follow me as I follow Christ. And when I don't, pray for me. And, and, and help me. And, and, and move in that direction. And God's going to direct. Let me ask you a question. Who are you following? Well, you want to say, I'm following Jesus. And, and that's accurate. And perhaps you're going to say that you followed the example of someone in your life that was a great spiritual mentor. I hope every one of you have spiritual mentors in your life. People of faith who blazed the way and, and walked the walk of faith in good times and bad and you saw their faith and you followed their example. In the context of the church, we were reviewing the other night our, our uh, Constitution. One clause that didn't change with respect to our Constitution when we adapted our new one is that the pastor is called to lead us to become a New Testament church. Not, not to be a denominational church. It says, called to lead us to become a New Testament church. Who better as an example to teach us what a New Testament church than the Apostle Paul? Who established the first churches. And he said, there's just a certain order. Follow me as I follow Christ. So I ask, who are you following? And in the context of the church, it's, it's the leadership in the church that are called to be pastors and shepherds and under-shepherds. Again, it's the call of God. It is not our choosing. I don't know that I've, I've ever said this, but I have prayed it many times. God, if I can do anything else and be happy and in your will, please let me do it. And I mean it. Because I'm very inadequate. But he's never given me that release. And the moment he does, I will share it. And I think Paul had a far more sensitive spirit to that calling. And that's what it means in the following. Because, beloved, here's the other thing. You're following the leadership or somebody. If you're not following the leadership, guess what else? Someone's following you. Right now, someone looks to you to show them the way. Not your way, God's way. Right now, someone prays because they heard you pray. Right now, someone's watching you fight your personal battles and how you're going to make it through. Right now, someone wants to be like you. Whether you're strong or weak, they, they've idolized you. They, they want to follow you. Someone right now is cheering you on. Right now, someone sees Christ in your life if you're letting that be demonstrated. Right now, someone may admire your strength. Right now, someone may be borrowing your faith because they have none. Right now, someone believes that you are the best Christian they know. 
Of course, all of us know better. Someone believes that hanging tough because you're standing tall. They're following you. Someone is smiling because they think of you. And someone thanks God for your friendship because it's faithful and it endures. Someone cares for you and makes the right choices. Someone is following you. Who are you following as they follow Christ? And who are you leading in your life? Because the truth of the matter is, you're either in this walk of faith and this walk of life. You either lead, follow, or get out of the way. But really, there's no getting out of the way. It's either lead or follow. Because someone's following you as you follow someone else. Principle number three. Know your enemies. Again, this is, these are the words of the Apostle Paul. Verses 18 and 19. He says, For I, I have often told you before, and now again say, even with tears. This broke his heart. Many, lie, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Now here's the flip side of the previous principle. We must follow faithful leaders and shepherds. But we also must watch out for our enemies. Now, who are these enemies of the cross? I want to say something here, and I want you to just think about it. I doubt if Paul would use such harsh language to describe people outside of the church. Because he was writing to the church. I believe he's talking about professing Christians because he knew the analogy, spoke of and taught of it, who are really wolves in sheep's clothing. And let me say, this, say it this way. Not every relationship is good for you. Not every relate. Not friends with everybody. Someone says that's dangerous. If you're friends with everybody, um, it's a dangerous thing because not every relationship is healthy for us. It may be a romantic relationship or a friendship or a school or the job or a relationship with a neighbor or a passing casual acquaintance. But if those people's work or, or, are aware of your relationship in your life or pulling you away from Christ. And what he has told you to do, that's not a good relationship. And you have to pull back. If they're pulling you away from Jesus, who do you want to follow? You want to follow Jesus, don't you? And so this is where we have to be sensitive to know that even among us sometimes there are those who go astray. And, and, and Paul says, don't, don't let that happen. Love, pray for them. Bring them back into a place of commitment. Principle number four. Remember your true identity. Now, I want to use this in a twofold way. We are all sheep. But we're also something else. We are, as Sylvia referred to in her prayer as she offered the offertory prayer, we are children of the king. He's our king. We are part of a royal priesthood. He did not just call you servants. He just did not call you sinners saved by grace. He did not just call you lost or sheep. He said, you are a royal priesthood. You are the sons and daughters of the living God. Jesus, at the conclusion of his life, said, I now call you my friends, but much more than that. Paul says, as Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, guess where you are if you're saved and following Christ? You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Did you not, Do you feel seated in heavenly places this morning? Okay, bring your feelings in line with your faith. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in the fact that Jesus said, you're going to be seated with me in heavenly places. And guess who sits in the throne room? <coughs> Only children of the King. You're not aliens. You're not visitors. You're not acquaintances. You are children, sons and daughters of the living God. John said it like this. When we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as he is. Beloved, we are now children of God. Live up to your country. Set your minds on things above. And not on all the things around this earth. Look at things from the perspective that with the mind of Christ, you look with the perspective of Christ. There's an enemy out there who wants to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. And sometimes he'll do it in the most subtle manner. But sometimes they'll just be brazen and, and throw a mess and mess upon your life. But greater is he who is in you 
than he who is in the world. You know, again, there's a... The, the, the citizenship, listen to this. Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And you know, again, verse 20 begins with a huge contrast. The enemies of the cross live for earthly things, earthly desires, earthly pursuits. Those are the enemies of the cross. Because what does the cross represent? Sacrifice and death. Can it be any clearer that if we live unto ourselves, we are not crucified with Christ? Being crucified with Christ means to die on the cross of our own desires. That we might be raised in the newness and power of his resurrection. And so that's what he says, and how interesting it is that we await that Savior from there who will transform our bodies so they'll be like his bodies. Our citizenship is in heaven. Here's an interesting fact. Just kind of remember this. You learned something this, this morning. Philippi and the Philippians, each one of those who were in that city, their citizenship was in Rome. And guess what? Rome was 800 miles away. But they had been granted the right and privilege to be not only residents of Philippi, but they had the full vesture of the rights of a citizen of Rome. And so they were protected by Rome. And you'll know that that's how Paul got a hearing before the higher authorities. He may have lived in Philippi, but he had a citizenship, a passport that says, my home is not Philippi, my home is Rome. You have that spiritual passport. Now if you want to live in this world, you're missing your inheritance. If you want to live on the plains of, of, of this sad, dry, dull existence, you're missing the citizen, citizenship of what it means to live as king's kids. The old song says, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Some of you will probably remember that. And here's the distinctions of what it means. And this is the last point. What does it mean to live as a citizen of, as a citizen of heaven? Number one, we're eager for Jesus to return to the earth. I don't know about you, beloved, but I'm ready. And I'm ready for him to be ready. In the early church, the term was Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's been the prayer for 2,000 years. And one thing I can guarantee you, I don't know when he's going to come, and I'm not going to start a rapture drill. Like some have tried to do, and been in error. But I'm going to tell you this, we're closer today than we were yesterday. And that's good news. And as we look around, the signs of the times are around us. And think about the world that crumbles, the kingdom of God will stand. I love the fact that you as a people of God this morning, as we sang the last scripture song, we said, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb. You rose up and stood in honor of the fact you know that Jesus is the Lamb. Much like people did a hundred years ago when they heard the Messiah. King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. You are part of that citizenship and that heritage. And don't let the devil or anybody else ever tell you anything less than that. Because it's a lie from the pit of hell. We're called to be king's kids. We're eager for Jesus to return to the earth. And we are expecting a glorious transformation of our earthly bodies. Actually, the word there is a schematic. Or a, and that's the reference in the, in the Greek. It comes from a Greek word. And it means a drawing or a diagram of our inner workings of a device. What do we know about our physical bodies? Well, we know they're made from the dust. And yet, he says, we're going to have glorious bodies. We know that our bodies will eventually return to the earth. And that's why we say ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And no one's really excited about being ash and dust. And yet, that's where we will end. But he's going to transform us and give a body as he has. And Philippians 3 ends with this ringing declaration that one day God is going to re schematic Never heard that happen. He's going to re-schematic our bodies. They're going to be raised from the dead and re-engineered to be like His glorious body. When we see Him, we shall be like Him because He's going to do the change. And what that means is there'll be no more reading glasses. There'll be no more men. That's why my print has gotten to be this big. If you wonder, how can you see without his glasses? 
pretty soon it's going to be one page per sentence, you know? <laughs> or one sentence per page. There'll be no more crutches, no more walkers, no more false teeth, no more diabetes, no more Alzheimer's, no more kidney failure, liver failure, no more disease, and no more death. That's good news, beloved. That's good news. But one of the most important things in the meantime is this, that should distinguish us as believers from unbelievers, is how we respond to turbulent times. It's in turbulence that our faith is tested. How will you be judged and graded on the faith that you exhibit during turbulent times? Close with this. Those of you who have heard the funerals that I've done, and probably other preachers, you'll be familiar with this. But for the sake of the one person who may not have been around or not heard it, there was a woman and she was living out in the country and um, didn't have any family, didn't have any close friends. She had been given a terminal diagnosis and she was accepting it with strength and with grace. And there was a new young pastor that came to minister in the parish. And she called him over and said, listen, I want to plan out my funeral. I want you to know the hymns that I'd like sung. I want you to know the scriptures that I'd like read. Uh, I want you to know the dress I'd like to be buried in. And uh, he's making all these fastidious notes. And uh, he said, anything else? She said, yes, there's one more request. And it's going to seem a little strange. He said, that's fine. What, what, what's the request? And she says, I want to be buried. Uh, with a fork in my left hand. He wrote it down and curiosity just got the best of it. He said, can I just ask why you want to be buried with a fork in your left hand? She said, well, the happiest times on earth in this life have been when I shared those times with friends, with family, and we gathered around the table and we were all happy and eating and passing the plates and talking, and, which meant she had to be Baptist. And, and then, when they were clearing the table, after filling ourselves with far too much food already, they'd say, keep your fork. We have dessert today. The best is yet to come. You know, wherever you are in life, and your plate may look empty. You ain't been to the kitchen yet. The best is yet to come. Just because it is not on the table now doesn't mean God hasn't prepared and got to be ready for it. By the way, if you think about crazy things of being married with people, um, I spoke at a funeral yesterday where a woman graduated from this life in glory having fought liver cancer, 56 years old, named Robin. Owned own Robin's Pools, Anchor Pools, some of you may know the Sophiquitas family. And I didn't know this woman, but the family had asked me to come minister, and I did. God gave her great grace. And her sister, she, Robin was a great animal lover, and her sister says, I hope this doesn't sound too crazy. She said, I put her little toy doll, not, not a real one, a little toy doll, in her casket because it's the little dog her husband bought her when he was going through brain cancer six years ago. And she loved animals. But she said, I did it not only for that. When you press the little dog, it played somewhere over the rainbow. And so the last thing they did before they closed the casket was have a little toy dog play somewhere over the rainbow. Crazy? Yeah. Unusual? Yeah. <clears throat> Undignified? Maybe. But it's okay. Because it was done in love. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day that we go to your word and we complete a series and now let it resonate in our hearts and be lived out in our lives that we would expect and know that there are going to be turbulent times in our life, times of our church, times of our family and on our jobs in the economy and in the world situation around us, but that you have given us faith, you've given us a calling to follow us as we follow Christ, follow leaders of the faith. And when those times occur, remind us, let this be ingrained in us that we will pray, we will remember, we will seek, and we will follow. 
we will follow you. Because you went to Calvary, and you did so for us. As we conclude this time of worship together, if there be anyone here, Father God, who's never made a public profession of Christ, who's never been baptized, who's never just said, I want you to be Lord in my life, let your spirit invite them to the front today to make that decision. And if there be anyone here today that says, I've made that decision, but I'm without a church home right now. I'm kind of a sheep out there, and I, I haven't joined a flock. And the Good Shepherd is calling me here. May this be the morning that they make that decision to respond to your call. And so, Father, we give you our lives, our church, and this service through Jesus and his grace. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Come now, found the third blessing if you'd like to make a decision this morning. This song only has three powerful verses, and so don't wait until the fourth verse to God. Okay?